Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kelsey De Rinaldis. I'm the Assistant Cultural Affairs Officer here at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Hiromi Murakami, Major Crystal Wilhite, and my colleagues, Christina Lay and Jessica Carrillo for today's event. The U.S. Embassy is hosting today's program in honor of Women's History Month, which we celebrate in March by highlighting the amazing contributions by women that have shaped the history, society, and culture of the United States. We also celebrate our diversity, which not only makes us stronger as a country, but reminds us that there is still much work that needs to be done to achieve greater gender equality. So we thank you for joining us today to engage in these important conversations that we hope lead to greater diversity and inclusion in both the US and Japan. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that today's event is on the record and will be recorded. There will be English and Japanese simultaneous interpretation. Captioning for today's program is also available through the UD Talk app or in your web browser directly. Instructions for connecting were sent out prior to today's event and can also be found in the chat box. Following the opening remarks and presentations, we will open the session for question and answers. We invite you to submit your questions throughout the session in the Q&A box. Uh, you can submit questions anonymously as well. Additionally, during today's program, we will be conducting audience polling. We encourage you to participate and it is also completely anonymous. So now, I would like to invite you all to engage with us in some audience polling questions. This helps us understand who is in the audience with us today and your thoughts on today's topic. The polling question should pop up on your screen now. And so we will give you a few moments to answer. Again, your answers are completely anonymous, so we encourage you to participate. There are three questions. Uh, the first question asks, uh, women should play active roles in the fields of peace and security. Agree, either agree or disagree or disagree. What is the first action that should be taken to strengthen women's participation in peace and security as our second question? And the third question is, is gender equality a concern for men, women, or both? So again, just a few more moments to allow you to answer. We thank you for your participation. more coming in. Now let me go ahead and share the results with everyone so you can take a look. Okay. Should women play active roles in peace and security? Agree uh, is the most uh, selected answer. We concur. Um, and great, I'm glad that is why you're joining today. You find that there is value in including um, everyone at the table when decisions are made in these fields. And there is a range of answers listed for how to take the first action to boost women's participation. And a great agreement that gender equality is a concern for both men and women. Wonderful, well, thank you all so much for taking a moment to participate in our poll. So without further ado, I would like to, in, I would like to introduce today's moderator, um, Jessica Carrillo, who will begin our program and introduce our keynote speakers. Jessica is currently a political military officer at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. Prior to this assignment, she served at the U.S. Consulate in Guangzhou, China, 
and in Washington with the Regional and Security Policy Office within the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Prior to joining the Foreign Service, Jessica interned at the Political Economic Section at the U.S. Embassy in Rangoon, Burma as a Pickering Fellow and worked for the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. She holds a master's degree from the University of Texas at Austin and a bachelor's degree from St. Mary's University. So with that, Jessica, over to you. Thank you, Kelsey. Good afternoon, everyone. As Kelsey mentioned, my name is Jessica Creo, and I work at the political military unit here at the US Embassy in Tokyo. I want to thank all of you for attending our Women's History Month virtual symposium, Achieving Peace and Security, a dis discussion on gender roles. Bringing people of diverse experiences and backgrounds can generate ideas and perspectives that would not be gained otherwise. This is true in business, media, in the classroom, and it is also true when it comes to achieving peace and security of a nation. Diversity particularly gender diversity, is essential to ensure that solutions to the challenges faced by a nation are well thought out and can consider the perspectives of women. After all, how can a country be expected to find a solution to a problem that affects both men and women when women are not even invited to the discussion? Research shows women's participation in conflict prevention, peace building, and disaster recovery tend to result in more stable and prosperous societies. Women, Peace, and Security, or WPS, is a policy framework that recognizes the importance of women's participation and promotes it. WPS is not just limited to physical security in a traditional setting. It also includes women's involvement in health security, diplomacy, as well as in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Many countries support women, peace, and security and recognize its importance, including both Japan and the United States. This recognition is what led the UN Security Council to pass a resolution on WPS in 2000. Japan has a national action plan on WPS and the United States has a national strategy on WPS. For this event, we have three speakers, all are women in fields that are traditionally considered male dominant. They will talk about their personal experiences in their respective fields, opportunities and challenges that they have faced and their thoughts for the future involvement of women in the fields of peace and security. It is our hope that this panel will encourage discussion about the importance of bringing gender diversity to these fields. Then we will move to Q&A where our speakers will answer questions from the audience. I will now introduce our speakers. First, we will hear from Chris Lay, the Deputy Political Military Unit Chief here at the US Embassy. She has served previously in Washington DC in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research and in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs covering the Philippines. She has been posted overseas at the U.S. Embassy in Athens, Greece, and the U.S. Consulate in Monterey, Mexico. Prior to joining the State Department, she held research positions at the Microfinance Nonprofit Organization and at the University of Chicago Harris's Graduate School of Public Policy. She also served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Kyrgyzstan. She graduated from the University of Chicago and speaks Vietnamese, Spanish, Japanese, Greek, and studied Kyrgyz. We will then hear from Major Crystal Wilhite, a Northeast Asia Foreign Area Officer and a major in the United States Army, where she currently serves as the Deputy Chief of Government Relations for United States Forces Japan at Ikota Air Base. She previously attended the Japan Self-Defense Forces Command and General Staff College at Megora Base in Tokyo as part of the Foreign Student Program. Major Wilhite has served in the United States Army since January 2001 with 28 months of combat experience as a platoon leader in Iraq and a company commander in Afghanistan. Major Wilhite holds a Master of Arts in Nuclear Nonproliferation and Terrorism Studies from Middlebury International Institute of International Studies, a Bachelor of Arts in Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Studies with a focus in military science and Spanish, and an associate's degree in Japanese language. Our final speaker will be Dr. Hiromi Murakami who is a visiting scholar at Global Health Innovation Policy Program at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, leading health security projects and conducting research on political studies on health crises. She is involved in various policy projects in both US and Japan, Japanese institutions, including the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, 
Global Health Policy Center, the Health and Global Policy Institute, or HGPI, and Economic Strategy Institute. Dr. Murakami is also an adjunct fellow at Global Health Policy Center of CSIS and senior fellow at the Economic Strategy Institute. And as if she wasn't already busy enough, she also teaches public policy analysis at Temple University of Japan, is a founder of Japan Institute for Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship, empowering women and younger generations in Japan. She holds an MBA from St. Mary's College, a PhD in international relations from the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. These women are so impressive and inspiring. We are very unfortunate to have them with us today. I will now turn it over to Chris Lay. Chris, over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on today's panel on this very important topic. Um, I will start by providing an overview of my personal experience in diplomacy and security. Um, I started my career as a Peace Corps volunteer in Kyrgyzstan, working on women's and girls' education and empowerment initiatives, um, including on combating uh, bride kidnapping and gender-based violence in rural areas. Following the Peace Corps, I worked at a microfinance nonprofit organization that focused on financial education, empowerment, and financing, especially for women in Malawi, Pakistan, and other countries. I joined the State Department in 2009 and served as an economic officer in Mexico, where I analyzed the impacts of narco-trafficking on foreign direct investment, economic growth, migration, and trade in Mexico. As a consular officer, I led the consular section's economic treaty visas for Mex Mexicans seeking to invest and open businesses in the United States. Next, I served as a political officer in Athens, Greece, where I oversaw human rights reporting and related public diplomacy efforts during an economic and refugee crisis that was exacerbated by the rise of far-right neo-Nazi political parties in Europe. As a Philippines desk officer in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs in Washington, DC, I led the development and implementation of political military policies related to the South China Sea during the Philippines dispute against China in the Hague's Permanent Court of Arbitration. I also helped increase US-Philippines security cooperation and assistance during this time, including negotiations on US military access. As a National Security Fellow at, Washington, at a Washington DC based think tank, I participated in a year long National Security Leaders Program led by former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, Michelle Fornoy, and engaged with a cohort of National Security Fellows from a diverse range of backgrounds in defense, military, civil society, private sector, journalism, academia, and development spheres. As a special assistant to the Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, I spent a year in the US intelligence community and saw firsthand how the Central Intelligence Agency, Defense Intelligence Agency, National Security Agency, FBI, and other intelligence agencies play a role in contributing to national security and foreign policy. And now as a Deputy Political Military Unit Chief in the US Embassy Tokyo, I focus on managing our US-Japan alliance. Um, in particular, issues related to Okinawa, uh, where we have a large number of US military bases and personnel. Today, I will focus my comments on three areas. First, opportunities for women in diplomacy and security. Second, challenges that women face. And lastly, areas for growth. First on opportunities. The inclusion of women in the field of diplomacy and security contribute to peace and long lasting change. Research and case studies of peace processes reveal how women's participation, whether in official negotiating roles or through grassroots efforts, contributes to long-lasting peace agreements. An International Peace Institute study of 182 signed peace agreements between 1989 and 2011 found that when women were, are included in peace processes, there is a 35% increase in the probability that a peace agreement will last 15 years or more. The participation of civil society groups, including women's organizations, makes peace agreements 64% less, 64 less likely to fail. When women participate in peace processes, the resulting agreement is more enduring and better implemented. Evidence indicates that women participants in peace processes are usually focused less on the spoils of war and more on reconciliation, economic development, education, and transitional justice, all critical elements of a sustained peace. Furthermore, higher levels of gender equality are associated with lower propensity for conflict. Women bring additional perspectives. For example, when I was in Greece, I would visit detention centers for migrants and refugees. 
They were run by Greek authorities, the vast majority of whom were men. During such a massive international refugee crisis, the Greek officials were focused on capturing and deporting migrants, not on respecting civil, civilian and humanitarian nature of refugee camps. I saw that they were not considering the needs of women and children in the design of refugee camps. Um, women and children were often placed together uh, with strangers, including men from many different other countries. This was unacceptable, and I was able to use the full force of the US government behind me to demand private sleeping areas for, and bathrooms for women and children. This type of perspective um, is seen through a gendered lens. Uh, this perspective seen through a gendered lens would not be possible without the participation of women. There are invisible barriers that men cannot see. This is not exclusive to just the diplomacy and peace and security. Data bias often excludes female perspectives. For example, car crash test dummies are modeled after a man's average weight and height. Medicinal doses are not specifically tested for women. And NASA's first all women spacewalk took 61 years to finally happen because spacesuits were not designed for women. In addition to providing diverse perspectives, women often act as conveners, bringing diverse groups together. For example, when I was in Mexico, I helped organize the first venture capital conference in Monterey, Mexico, bring investment opportunities to small and medium sized enterprises with over 60 speakers and 300 participants. In Greece, I worked with the State Department, the Department of Justice and Department of Homeland Security to organize a conference on combating discrimination, violence and intolerance based on religion and national origin, bring together groups, of, uh, bring together groups in Greece that had little interaction with each other. Uh, civil society and minority groups um, with representatives from government ministries, police and prosecutors um, to discuss problems faced by illegal migrants, trafficking victims and other marginalized groups. In both instances, I could influence the participants and speakers. Oftentimes organizers of such, such events have blind spots and overlook diversity and representation. As a woman, you know how often you are the only woman in the room or the only, only minority. And so you don't have those blinders. In decision-making positions, you can help influence and shape events to be inclusive of less represented groups and therefore bring opportunities and, and convene diverse groups. Women can also serve in positions that are seen as non-threatening to the status quo. As a woman, you are sometimes perceived as non-threatening to men. One US diplomat told me that the local police and military counterparts in a foreign country were very open to working with her and would often privately express their preference for her over her male colleagues or those who had military or police backgrounds. Um, because she is a woman, the law enforcement officials and military didn't feel they had to show how tough they were or engage in competition as if she were a man. She could more efficiently get down to business instead of sizing one another up and the local police chief was more likely to admit what kind of help he needed. Oftentimes as a foreigner or a representative of the US government, your gender or race disappears. Your foreign counterparts don't see you as a woman or a minority. They see the position or the status of the US government. This is an advantage. They see you as a position, not as a woman. Women can also empower other women. Just being present can empower other women. As a US diplomat, as a civilian in a position of power, and usually as the only female in the room, you can empower a foreign country's female counterpart. This applies not only in foreign environments, but in your own country as well. For instance, when I was in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, I went to another US intelligence agency for a briefing. And halfway through the presentation, a petite Asian woman entered the room and sat in the back. I smiled at her and, and thought she was the assistant to the male speaker. Well, once the male speaker noticed her, he stopped, introduced her as his boss and as the head of the operations of a massive enterprise and ceded the floor to her. It was a lesson in unconscious bias, but also really wonderfully empowering to see a woman like me in charge of, a, of a, an influential US organization. Next, I'd like to talk about challenges. Women's participation can improve outcomes, as I've shared here, but women are often excluded or ignored. For example, one of my colleagues told me that when she negotiates with her Japanese counterpart, when they disagree with her statement, they will sometimes just ignore it, even when she repeats herself. On one occasion, a junior member of her team, who is male, 
repeated what she had already emphasized, and it was only then that they finally acknowledged the point. This continued failure to include women ignores their demonstrated contributions and overlooks a potential strategy to respond more effectively to security threats around the world. A colleague in Pakistan told me that her local staff were all male, uh, which affected their ability to access certain parts of society and speak to certain people due to the strict gender segregation of some of the communities. Female officials frequently have access to populations and venues that are closed to men, which allows them to gather intelligence about potential security risks. Oftentimes women have important information about what's going on, but would only be willing to share that information with other women. Another US diplomat told me that as the human rights officer in a country with a history of sexual abuse and violence, her male predecessors at the US Embassy often just reported statistics provided by the government officials. But as a woman, this US diplomat was able to bring together key female political contacts to gather information. The environment was much more comfortable for women to share stories of sexual harassment and corruption. The female politicians revealed that they had all been propositioned and felt that they had to exchange favors in order to succeed. The US diplomat was able to provide, provide reports to the State Department on why, despite many female politician contenders for president existed, their path to the presidency would be blocked by overwhelming sexual harassment and assault. Lastly, I'd like to talk about growth. As a foreign woman or a representative of the US government, we may be accepted and viewed as falling outside of cultural and gender norms of that country. This helps us conduct the business of diplomacy in foreign environments, but it doesn't help us in domestic environments or in overcoming our own country's institutional barriers. Women aspiring to become leaders in the national security field face two types of gender bias, structural barriers to leadership and individual attitudes and perceptions of female leaders rooted in traditional gender expectations. Both are extremely detrimental to gender equality. The United States and the State Department are not immune to these problems either. Currently, the US diplomatic corps is 32% female in the senior levels. Lack of representation affects our ability to conduct effective diplomacy around the world. There's a need to appoint more women to leadership positions, including ambassadorship. But female representation at the top is not only what is needed. From entry level to the mid ranks, full participation of women in peace and security is necessary. In the State Department, assignments matter. Landing top assignments in your career opens up doors and pathways to success and allows doors to be open for mentorship and sponsorship of other women. Biases against women and minorities in leadership roles affect their selection for top assignments. Male job candidates are largely judged by their potential while female candidates tend to be evaluated based on their past performance. But if women aren't given opportunities to succeed in the first place, how can they even show past performance in order to compete? Women are held to higher standards because their leadership potential is less likely to be recognized than men. Women are implicitly required to show greater evidence of competence to overcome stereotypically negative performance expectations, particularly in male-dominated fields. There are challenges to a woman's credibility in male-dominated environment where men's leadership traits are the standard for comparison. A model for a leader is to be dominant and aggressive, not collaborative and compassionate. However, this paradigm is slowly evolving as we've seen in New Zealand, Taiwan, Germany, and other countries with female leaders. Effective leadership does not have to be measured by standards set by men. There's a lot of work to be done in this area, and one silver lining to the pandemic is a demonstration of the efficacy of telework and flexible work systems. The traditional workplace is based on a 1950s model in which the man is a sole income earner in a household, working long hours while the wife takes care of the household and childcare. With women in the workforce, there's a shift, but the system hasn't caught up to the demands of childcare, elder care, and distribution of household labor. Hopefully through the pandemic, companies and governments can adapt to workplace structures in which family needs are taken into consideration. So there's a lot of areas for growth for women, and I hope that my presentation was helpful in shedding some light on the role of women in diplomacy and security. 
Um, this is a lot of information to unpack and analyze from what I've discussed. Um, so I welcome any questions in our question and answer session. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Chris. You shared some great insights, particularly about unconscious bias, as well as the types of chains and perspectives that women can provide in peace and security. I was particularly moved by your work in Greece. You fought to help um, migrants and refugees receive better humanitarian treatment. So thank you for sharing your story with us. Now we will hear from Major Wilhite. Major Wilhite, please take it away. Thank you, Jessica. First, I wanna thank everyone that helped put this event together. And for the listeners who are taking the time out of their very busy schedules to hear how we can come together to encourage women to voice their ideas and enhance the gender perspective in peace and security. My name is Crystal Wilhite. I am a major in the United States Army. I have been serving in the military for more than 20 years and have encountered both challenges and opportunities. Serving in the defense sector, my current position is the Deputy Chief of Government Relations here in Japan. I am married with two wonderful children and together have been living in Japan since late 2016. I have spent the last eight years focused on expanding my knowledge of Northeast Asia, specifically the US-Japan Alliance, the Japanese culture, and the Japanese language. My journey to Japan began in the summer of 2013 when the US Army provided me the opportunity to learn Japanese at the US Defense Language Institute of Monterey, followed by studying nuclear nonproliferation and terrorism with a focus on Northeast Asia at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California. After graduation, I had the pleasure of welcoming my son into the world, where just 12 weeks later, we moved to Tokyo so that I could attend the Ground Self-Defense Forces Command and General Staff College as an international student. This was extremely challenging. Moving my family to another country with an infant and teenage daughter while also immersing myself in a different language and culture. What I discovered is that our alliance is important. Our forces have much in common and we are better together than alone. Although I was the only female with a child in my class, my classmates and my instructors were extremely supportive with my breastfeeding journey. I would like to think I am one of the few women who ever had to worry about how to transport breast milk on a military aircraft from the Japanese military base of the island of Iwo To, formerly known as Iwo Jima. Women in the defense sector truly have a unique perspective. My first assignments in the military were in human resources, where I mostly focused on ensuring the soldiers in my unit were taken care of administratively in actions such as pay and awards. Shortly after I had my daughter in 2004, I decided that I wanted to make the military my career and dedicated my efforts to attending the Army Officer Candidate School, where I earned my commission as a US Army Military Intelligence Officer. I would be remiss to mention that, that during my 20 years in the Army, I had the opportunity to serve as a platoon leader and intelligence support officer in Iraq for 15 months and a company commander in Afghanistan for 13 months. The experiences derived from both deployments opened my eyes to the multitude of challenges that women and children face during war and allowed me to provide a gender perspective in combat planning and mission execution. When I deployed to Iraq, I was a mother of a toddler. So I was able to relate to the health and welfare of the women and children impacted by combat. I recall going on a mission on the streets of Baghdad one night where I encountered a group of women and children. I truly felt that my presence on the team for that mission eased the tension they felt and perhaps helped them understand that we were truly there to help them when they didn't understand our language or our actions. I spent 15 months away from my daughter, but I knew that she was taken care of by her father 
and with the support of the military community. This peace of mind allowed me to focus on the very important mission versus what was going home on on the home front. I have found that the inclusion of women in combat and HADR missions contribute to peace and enduring change for the better. As the Women, Peace and Security Act of 2017 reads, the meaningful participation of women in conflict prevention and conflict resolution processes helps to promote more inclusive and democratic societies and is critical to the long-term stability of countries and regions. This month, as we stand together as an alliance to remember the devastation that occurred in March 2011 during the Great Tohoku earthquake and the resulting tsunami and radiological crisis, I would like to take a moment to recognize the importance of gender perspectives during the disaster, but also the critical need to ensure that gender perspectives are applied during recovery efforts and reconstruction. I have seen the inclusion of women in combat and HADR. During my time preparing for and executing missions in Iraq and Afghanistan, it was prudent to consider how to create and secure women and children during operations. The gender perspective is necessary to carry out successful operations in combat or in HADR. For example, when conducting recovery operations, there must be someone in the planning that gives due consideration to unique situations such as pregnancy, breastfeeding, infant formula, etc. A planner that does not consider, consider gender during planning may discount more than half of the population's unique medical and physical requirements, which would lead to insufficient supplies both at the disaster site and during recovery operations. Such a miscalculation could lead to overall mission failure. Now, I want to talk about the role of women in the US military. Women have served the United States Army since the Revolutionary War. Today, more than 174,000 women serve in the total force. Women serve in every career field in the Army and are critical members of the Army team. The Army is proud of today's women soldiers who serve with distinction and are role models, exemplifying the Army's core values of integrity, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, and personal courage. Women's History Month reminds us of the strength the Army has gained through a high quality, diverse, all volunteer force. I joined the Army at the age of 18 years old. I wanted to make an impact with my life and positively affect society. I felt a calling to do something greater and significant with my life. And given that I had no money for college at the time, I decided that the United States Army would help me achieve my goals. I initially joined for four years, after which I thought I would get out and go to college. I have always wanted to become a teacher, but I decided after the birth of my daughter that a military career offered stability for my family while continuing to serve society. Therefore, I decided to make the military my career. In the military, after 20 years, we have the opportunity to retire and start a second career. I am going to do just that. Having internalized the Army's highest values and impactful experiences of leading soldiers and also of following great leaders, I have decided to challenge myself to attain, attain my first goal in life of becoming a teacher. After 20 years in the defense sector, I have learned that there are many ways that we can serve and defend our nation. I want to focus on children next as they are the future of humanity. From a perspective of peace and security, they are truly the ones that matter the most for years to come. Serving in the military does not mean having to achieve work-life balance. It does mean having to achieve work-life balance, especially when children are involved. I am a mother of two. I could not be both a mother and a soldier without a strong support network that understands the challenges women face as they enter into motherhood. The more supportive the network, the greater the longevity of women in the defense sector. 
Gender perspective is critical to weaving the support network. I find balancing my roles as a mother and wife with my obligations as an army, army officer can be challenging. My day does not end when I walk in the door at home after work. My role shifts from soldier to mother. My four-year-old son demands my attention and I feel it is my responsibility to provide that to him, regardless of how exhausted I may be from a long day at work. Balancing work and private life is difficult, but the investment of time and energy is well worth the rewards. Having a strong support network makes challenges of life as a mother and soldier easier. As a community, we share the responsibility of maintaining an environment that develops and nurtures the next generation. I hope my actions serve as a positive role model for not only my daughter, but for my community. The Department of Defense has made great efforts to ensure the participation of women in conflict prevention, mitigation, and resolution. Additionally, during military operations, we must protect civilians from violence, exploitation, and human trafficking. It is necessary for all like-minded partners to ensure adherence to international human rights laws. We must also consult with each other on efforts to enhance the negotiation process by ensuring meaningful participation of women as a women peace and security representative for the United States Forces Japan, I challenge members of my unit to consider the gender perspective in every aspect of our daily actions. While I cannot speak for other women in the military in terms of challenges, I believe many of us experience similar issues. There are various platforms available for women in the defense sector to gather to discuss their experiences, both in person and virtually. I am a member of multiple social media groups that are specific to military females, such as Women's Mentorship Network and Breastfeeding and Combat Boots. Having a platform for women to openly discuss the unique issues of our gender and their way of life is critical to find solutions to problems historically not experienced by the majority of the force. In addition, we need to advocate for continuous education and dedication to look for qualified women to participate in the defense sector by seeking out women with an array of experiences from all over the world and establishing a safe environment for an open dialogue. Our world leaders are able to hear all voices and address concerns in a more comprehensive manner. The Department of Defense has a network of women peace and security advisors and subject matter experts who advise and train senior leaders, commanders and staff and how to integrate WPS principles into policies, plans, and operations, and partner, partnering engagements. Experience attending the Command and General Staff College with the Self-Defense Forces as a female and international student was eye-opening. Approximately 10% of my class was female, and I was the only female international student. My classmates welcomed me. I felt like part of the group but I could not help to see how my other female classmates were solely career focused, unlike many of our male classmates who were already married with children. Not only was I the only mother in the group of women, most of my classmates were men. It was clear that a woman's desire to lead a successful career could be influenced by the choice to also have typical gender related roles in private life, such as wife and mother. Finally, I want to end on a quote by Robert L. Wilkie, both in uniform and through the civilian sector, American mothers, daughters, sisters, and wives have selflessly served to defend and protect the land of the free and home of the brave. Even in grim situations and under austere conditions, these women have persevered, standing tall and strong as defenders of freedom, liberty, and justice. I look forward to having the opportunity to answer any questions you may have in the questions and answer time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Major Wilhite. That was an amazing quote. Thank you for sharing your story with us and your insights. In particular, I wanna thank you for reminding us that women have multiple roles and how important it is to have the support to be able to balance those roles. So thank you. Now I will hand the floor over to Dr. Murakami. Dr. Murakami, over to you. Hi, thank you. Thank you. 
I'd like to share my presentation material. My name is Hiromi Murakami. I am from National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, Global Health Innovation Policy Program. Thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to talk about my own experiences and what I have felt throughout my career. So first, when I was approached, what I wanted to know was those uh, kind of um, health security or global health. These are the areas of my research. And in those uh, areas, uh, why, why is it that uh, I have led this career? And this is uh, because of my experience uh, working and studying in the United States. I have taught in universities as well as in graduate schools. I have been a researcher in think tanks as well. You may not no, what do researchers do? So let me just talk about this. We write reports, we write books and papers. We take part in such panel discussions as this one. We may be interviewed and our answers may be cited. So that's what researchers do. So I'd like to talk about my career path. So um, from the second year of junior high to the first year of senior high school, because of my father's um, employment, I spent my time in the US. This brought about a lot of impact on my life. So what was that? It was that um, I was still young and I went outside of Japan and saw the world and found different values outside of Japan. And I had that experience first hand. I went back to Japan and I went to science and engineering in university. All other students were male, so it was a big culture shock. And then I joined a Japanese company as a system engineer. That was a career track. Why I chose that particular company was it was considered a women friendly company. It was ranked at the top of that category. So that's why I thought that uh, I could work there uh, for a long time. And I, I thought I could feel quite comfortable there. But actually, the reality was different. For instance, study abroad opportunities were given only to male employees. I wanted to study abroad as well. But then I was told that uh, um, as you get married and have a childbirth, you will quit. And uh, um, if you do not have any prospect of uh, continuing to work, I can't. we can't give you an opportunity. That's why I decided to go to an MBA course in the United States. And then there was an exchange program uh, to go to France. So I took part in that. And I also worked for a German company. So I spent some time in Germany as well. But as a Japanese person, um, I studied and worked in the United States as well as in Europe, but then I, grew my desire to know more about Japan and Asia. Therefore, I went to Washington, D.C. I went to a graduate school for uh, studies of international relations. And while I was a student there, I was also an intern. And then uh, what made a big impression on me was it was at CSIS, where I was an intern. And then um, there was the um, presidential advisor in charge of security, um, Dr. Bresnit. Bruce Zinski I was there. I was an intern under him. Every day was full of inspiration. It was not easy, but I learned so much from that experience. And then uh, there was uh, Dr. Asaya, uh, Dr. Francis Fukuyama, Kent Calder. I was there with them doing the projects and others at universities. And what I felt was that uh, under uh, such um, researchers at the forefront of the research field, uh, I could get valuable experiences that were not really available being in Japan. So now talking about opportunities and the challenges, in terms of opportunities, I went to the United States and studied abroad at the graduate school. And uh, more than half of the graduate school students were women in the United States. And at work, even young people were given opportunities. You work hard, you write good reports. 
as long as you do that, you are recognized by others around you and you are highly regarded. So that was a great opportunity for me. So what were the challenges? So it was a Japanese society. So when I joined a company that was in the late 1980s, so that was when there was a law on equal employment opportunity uh, being formulated back in the 1980s. So that was uh, supposed to give equal opportunity for employment or hiring. But then uh, after uh, joining the company, I thought there was uh, equal opportunities, but that wasn't, the, that wasn't the case. There was no opportunity for me to study abroad. There was uh, no opportunity for getting promoted. And there are also Japanese traditional, very conservative values. I was hired as a system engineer, but I was seen as a woman. And therefore, um, my opportunities were taken away. And that was happening not just to me, but to others as well. And uh, I, I could not solve this problem myself because it was a problem of the Japanese society as a whole. So it's not just me. So uh, why is it that uh, I needed to leave Japan once again while I actually wanted to stay in Japan and work there? So let me talk about that. So I went to the US and to Europe. So what I feel is that Japan has its own idiosyncrasy. It's quite peculiar. So this is just one example. This is about a higher tertiary education uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the uh, students. And only in 1988, uh, 30 years ago, the uh, women's uh, numbers outnumbered uh, the male students. But still, if you look at the agenda, um, proportion uh, in the uh, central government offices, it's only um, 24 percent. So I thought that there was a gender inequality in private companies, but I thought in central government offices, there was an equality between men and women. That's what I thought, but that was not actually the case. So the women's proportion was only 4%, that's correction, not 24%, but 4%. And then uh, there was unconscious bias, which was a very tall wall for us. And this is just another example. This is looking at Japanese women uh, in advanced degrees. And uh, among all 43 countries, Japan is ranked at the bottom. So when I, I express my feeling of uh, studying uh, in a graduate school, um, people around me would tell me, if you study too hard, you wouldn't be able to get married. So in Japanese society, there are different roles between men and women, and these uh, values are so much uh, uh, ingrained and imprinted in the minds of the people. So if you have higher degree as a woman, you won't be able to get married. So that's what's been told to me. So that was a Japanese that, um, society. That was a tall hurdle for me. So conservative and the traditional values are imprinted in people's mind, and there's unconscious bias there in Japan. And roles between men and women, you may not notice that, but those roles are imprinted from early years of life. And if you go outside of Japan, you'll be able to see that very clearly. So women, peace and security, WPS action plan has been formulated here in Japan. But if you look at the actual document, those action plans are directed at developing countries and it's about ODA. So what about uh, uh, inside Japan back in 1999, basic law on gender equality participation society was formulated, but what happened afterwards? So in Japan, um, the legal change occurs very belatedly because of the conservative values there. The uh, legal change occurs uh, very late. Unless legal change occurs, there won't be the change in values. But we, Japan, ratify the UN Committee on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, but the UN Committee uh, on several occasions 
gave recommendations to Japan to modify the discriminatory legal systems in Japan, but those systems have not been changed. For instance, civil code is one. Marriage is allowed for 18 years old for men and 16 years old for women. From 2022, it is going to be 18 years for both genders, but then only when 2022, uh, this uh, discrimination by age is going to be eliminated. And as for marriage, only for women, there is a regulation that women need to wait for up to 100 days. Why is it? And separate family names are not allowed in Japan legally. It's only Japan. And also um, born um, the uh, um, inheritance um, money uh, can now be given to both um, uh, those uh, children born outside of marriage and inside marriage. And this discrimination was eliminated only in 2013, but that wasn't uh, uh, pushed by lawmakers. Uh, it was because of the Supreme Court decision that forced this legal change, which is quite unfortunate. And as you know, um, in terms of the gender index, we are ranked 121. This is uh, below uh, UAE, 120 above us, and also Sierra Leone and India, uh, they are above us as well. So as you can see from this data, uh, we do not have many Jap uh, women leaders in Japan, and also professional um, qualified people. The uh, House of Representatives for Women rate is only 7% in the LDP. And in terms of researchers, women ratio is 15.7%. The US is the double number. And the professorship uh, here in Japan, it's only 13.4%, 33% in the US. And as mentioned by Christina, uh, in terms of diplomacy, uh, Japan, uh, I mean, women are very good at diplomacy. But in terms of the ambassadorship, uh, only five women in Japan out of 205 ambassadors and this is looking at the survey conducted in 2020 so um 60 percent of the people in japan think that uh, we have very little or a few number of uh, women lawmakers and the reason being uh, politics are for men and that is a kind of a role of the a kind of consciousness, and also uh, their discriminations and the harassment against women lawmakers, and also lack of understanding on the part of the male lawmakers. And this comes from conservative values and also unconscious bias. So global health and diplomacy, international relations, research, as well as development, and also disaster management. These are the areas where women can shine. But then there aren't many women just yet, as Christina said. Um, gender perspective uh, can be fully utilized in diplomacy, but that's not been done in Japan. So we still need to improve a lot. So uh, in 2017, I was really struck by this. So that was under the Trump administration. And the, uh, the Trump administration withdrew uh, uh, its assistance to international agencies and women lawmakers and also the top executives, women executives from uh, private companies as well as from NGOs and women researchers came together uh, to uh, talk about uh, global health and diplomacy and uh, to spend more money for the U.S. to support women and girls in developing countries. So they raised their voice. And I was really impressed by this meeting. But it's probably um, something that is uh, very much uh, missing in Japan. And it's probably too early for Japan to realize this because of very high hurdles. The first wall is that the women have to go against traditional values and gain understanding from the people around them. That's not easy. What is needed is a, a change of the rules. That needs to come first. If rules are changed, the people's mindsets may be changed. So that's my expectation. The second hurdle is, as Christina pointed out, um, uh, women need to prove herself uh, that they are more competent than men. So. Um, women leaders have overcome those very high hurdles. Talking about unconscious bias, a lot of people think that women are not for leaders. But um, this uh, coronavirus pandemic and that this pandemic, uh, who really did well was women leaders. 
as you can see. And they were very decisive from the beginning and they have empathy. What do I mean by empathy? This is uh, to have imagination of other, um, the other people. Empathy needs to be there uh, to gain confidence of the people and the trust of the people. And women uh, have a strong interest in social security and education. And women are very uh, careful in terms of safety and security. So finally, uh, this is uh, the chief uh, of former chief of IEA, Mr. Dobu Otanaka. He spent 13 years in international organizations. And he said that talented uh, women in Japan have not been fully utilized. And the accident that took place 10 years ago at Fukushima, uh, the nuclear power accident, if uh, the chief of that organization was a woman, that accident may not have taken place. Because uh, uh, female leaders, uh, they are not really worried about how they would be perceived. So according to him, uh, probably the women leader could have secured more safety at such plant. So this is something uh, that I would not like the young women to feel. Uh, with this, uh, I presented my presentation and I'd like to answer your questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Murakami. Thank you so much for your insights and for your story. Um, you know, very inspirational and very insightful. You have truly done and are continuing to do a lot of great work in the field of health security, and you are doing a lot of inspiring the next generation of leaders of Japan. So thank you so much for your time. So now I'd like to go ahead and move on to the Q&A period. And we're going to ask our panelists questions from the audience surrounding presentations and WPS. So we are waiting for the audience to submit their questions in the Q&A box. I will now ask some of the pre submitted questions. So starting from this question is going to be asked to uh, Dr. Murakami and then um, others can comment as they would like to. Um, who is the role model that has influenced your life and the way you approach your work? I don't have uh, anyone specific, but I went to the United States and met many people, as Christina said, and uh, as Crystal said, um, I was surrounded by female peers in the United States. So I learned from them and I was influenced by them. And as for mentors, uh, I had more male mentors than female mentors. So I didn't have many female role models, but Clyde Prestwitz, and when I was interning, Dr. Brzezinski, they taught me a lot, and I was influenced by what they were doing. I learned the right attitude, and if I kept that attitude, I felt that I could be successful. So I don't have a specific one person, but I've, uh, I got influence from many people around me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murakami. Crystal or Christina, do you, Crystal, sorry, Jewel Height, please go ahead. Hi, um, so I 100% agree with Murakami San, who said attitude is important. Attitude is extremely important when developing both mentors as well as mentoring. And I think that's a key indicator as well is we have to mentor the next generation, not just the next generation of females, but also the next generation of men so that they can change their perspective on women in the defense sector. Um, so the most influential person in my life was actually my grandmother. Um, my grandfather passed away early on. And so she was a blind woman that was empowered to take care of her children and her grandchildren. Um, so her as my role model to see exactly how a strong woman should be and how they're capable of doing difficult things in place of a man in their life um, was important. Um, just as Murakami-san had said, uh, most of my mentors have actually been male colleagues. 
they're, they're the men out there that have empowered me to speak my mind, have guided me and have shown me exactly what it is not to lose my female perspective in the defense sector, but actually used me as a, an offensive weapon per se. They, they've used me to inspire other individuals as well as when HADR planning or any other type of military missions were there. They mentored me to speak my voice and to make sure that I made all of my male colleagues listen. Um, as for the female individuals that have mentored me, it's folks that have been in my, in my shoes. Um, I knew I was a mother, I knew I was a wife. And so I have sought out those female mentors that also have children and husbands and gathered their very um, distinct characteristics that comes with being a mother and a, a wife in the military. Um, so just using their understanding and their frank discussions to show me that it is hard and I'm not alone and what I experience is okay to experience. Um, so I think having the female mentors to show you that you have a support network and what you are facing is a shared thing and that together we can overcome it um, is important. Thank you, Mildred Real Hyde. Um, Chris, do you have any comments? Uh, yes. So one of my favorite quotes is from John F. Kennedy, and he said that one person can make a difference and everyone should try. And I really love that because um, it really motivates me in my life. And one of my role models um, was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is a Supreme Court justice. And I think she embodied that quote in her actions and deeds. And she in her life before she became a Supreme Court justice, she changed the laws in the United States that opened doors not only for women, but also men in terms of gender equality. And so I think that in everything that I do, I try to keep that in mind, that my actions are not just for myself, but also opening doors for other people as well. Um, in terms of mentors, um, I just want to note that mentorship and sponsorship are two different things and sponsorship is just as important as mentorship. And just like Major Will Height had said and Murakami Sensei had said, they are, you can have sponsors and mentors who are not like yourself. So they can be men and they can have aspects of their lives that you admire and respect, but maybe not agree with as well. So I think in mentors and sponsorship, as you're seeking them out, you're not going to find someone who is exactly like yourself or exactly um, follow the same path that you want to follow. But I think taking uh, wisdom from different people will help um, guide you in your path. Um, and then in terms of sponsorship, these are people who will open doors for you that you don't need to have um, constant uh, care and feeding in terms of uh, building a relationship, but someone who um, can help um, provide opportunities for you in the future. So I think those are very important to cultivate. And also as um, Major Will Height said, finding people to mentor as well. So uh, finding people that you see something special and then and, and helping them um, on their path. So I really, really appreciate their comments as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, another question here. So this is for any of the panelists. How do we tackle the idea that some women are in powerful positions, not for their abilities, but because of their gender or a specified gender quota? So I have um, a response to that, if I may. Um, I think that there are many people who believe that women or minorities are in positions of power um, only because of their gender or race. Um, and this is a very insidious way of undermining women and minorities. It, it basically puts uh, women on the defensive um, to have to prove themselves from the start and creating self-doubt and an unfair standard um, to have to work twice as hard. Um, I think that we should flip that uh, completely and examine why we as a society permit the systemic inequalities that allow mediocre men to succeed and keeps out qualified women. Let's look at the value governments and institutions of power have when actually reflect the population they represent, which is 50% female. Um, we see underqualified men in positions of power 
but we don't question it because we have been conditioned to view men as leaders. Overqualified women, on the other hand, are pushed out or discouraged because it creates cognitive dissonance in our perceptions of leadership and power. It's because we fully haven't normalized or accepted women in leadership positions. Um, and both men and women are guilty of these biases that prevent the election of female politicians or selection of women to leadership positions in the private sector. So changing society's biases and raising awareness takes time and normalizing women in leadership can be helped by demonstrating that it's possible. So gender quotas do just that. Um, they can reduce gender discrimination in the long term and normalize the idea of women in leadership positions and neutralize biases. Um, the positive effects of gender quotas are backed by a growing body of research from economists. So for example, in 1993, Sweden's Social Democratic Party implemented a quota that required local branches of a party to alternate between male and female candidates on the ballot. Um, in 2017, a group of economists published a study uh, showing what happened before and after the quota. The extensive analysis concluded that the government improved because the quota caused highly skilled women to enter government and displace mediocre male leaders. So while we don't have a um, gender quota system in the US, a lot of European countries do. And I think over time, we'll see the results are out. There are positive effects of, of having quotas. Um, if I could also please just speak to this one. Um, I 100% I agree with uh, Ms. Le on how a quota system can be positive, um, but I want to emphasize that it's putting the right person to that seat. Um, if we have the establishment of a quota system that is how we perceive the gender gap between our societies, um, that by itself is not actually making the determination of whether or not that woman has the voice and has the voice to influence um, by having that seat. Um, we can have just the same possibility that the men that are choosing the women to put into that quota seat are choosing passive individuals that maybe would not voice their concerns. So really it's the perception that one country might be better in leading the, the defense sector in women and equality when in what is actually going on is just having women that would be completely passive in those seats. Um, so I think that we have to empower the women and as the gender gap and the analysis that goes through, maybe we should see not just the number of women, but what influence do those women have in the country? So if there's one woman, one woman out of five males in Japan or three women out of five males in another country, do those three women really have the same voice as that one? And so I think we should challenge ourselves to see what is actual equality in the quota system versus just a number. So let me just add uh, the quota system. I think that is required, especially in Japan, because there are so few um, women leaders so we have to start from somewhere, and that can be quota system. Uh, people say that uh, um, women, um, we don't find uh, women who are qualified for such high positions, but it's just because uh, those women were not given opportunities. So that's why. So that's why we need to have quota system. First and foremost, we need to have women in those positions, and then they can have more experiences. And then um, when we strike a good balance, then we can eliminate such quota system, and anybody who is uh, talented and qualified uh, can sit in that position. So we have to learn from the US. And uh, we do not have a um, um, very good network uh, in Japan, women supporting women. So that is something that we need to promote in Japan as well. Thank you. So Dr. Murakami, um, we have a couple of questions for you. But I'm gonna ask here that I have from um, someone who completed their PhD in Japan and master in the United States. Um, they say that they strongly agree with you that Japan needs more female leaders but they also are planning to leave Japan so that they can get credits in the career they deserve. What is your opinion on the fact that many educated Japanese women are leaving Japan instead of changing it from the inside? Um, 
hard to change the system alone. It's hard to change the company alone. So one person's power is only limited. So I had to change my environment during my my time. But when I went to Washington, there were many women with Japanese women with master's degree, for example. So I was wondering why they can't be successful in Japan. That was the kind of question I had at that time. So Japan is trying to achieve gender equality or improve gender equality. But because of the our traditional social values, we receive questions like, why are you doing this? And there aren't many women willing to run for uh, official seats in the diet. So changing from within, if we want to do that, we need men's understanding. They, we need to team up with men. We need their support. So we need both men and women to work together, child rearing, taking care of your family, cooking meals for family should be everyone's responsibility. So we, we have, so maybe different from our traditional values, but we need can do attitude. So everyone needs to change. We need to change rules. For example, we need changes in various aspects. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murakami. Um, another question here um, for all panelists. What are the qualities of a leader in the area of peace and security? I can go ahead and, and, and start this if someone else wants to follow afterwards. So I think one of the qualities of a leader in women, peace and security um, is to think outside the box, think outside the gender norms, think outside of what you typically have seen in historical and what you need to see in order to focus on the entire population. Um, so a leader that only looks from their own perspective discounts the perspectives and the necessities of everybody else in that community. Um, and so a good leader in women, peace and security doesn't necessarily think that they have to change who they are, but that they can influence the change in other people's opinions to look outside of what they typically see as the norm. If I may add, in terms of women's leadership style empathy is unique to women and very special ability so with empathy no matter how severe the conflict is you can i guess reduce the tension and that's what women are good at so you don't so leading the a combat situation is not the only type of leadership so women has their own strength and we should take advantage of those strengths that we have i, I just want to point out that in the u.s women peace and security specifically the defense sector because that's what i can speak to uh, we have men in those leadership positions as well uh, when i went through the women peace and security training uh, with my colleagues um, half the class, if not more than half the class, was actually men. Um, and it was the point that it's providing all of the perspectives. It's not just about women. So there shouldn't be a group of women sitting around a table talking about women, peace, and security. Um, it should be everybody um, talking about that. Um, thank you so much, Major Will Hyde, and thank you, Dr. Murakami. Um, I have time now for two more questions. So um, next question, um, in order to raise women participation rate in conferences, organizations, um, they sometimes assign women to positions. So for instance, Tokyo Olympics. Um, in terms of numbers, gender equality might be achieved, but do you think this is the correct way to combat gender inequality? So this is back to the gender quota and or should women be assigned to a position just 
because they're women. Um, I think that uh, my answer earlier already touched on this, but I'll just reemphasize that um, there are secondary benefits and, and um, effects of having someone be assigned in a position, whether it be an ambassadorship or whether it be on a board uh, such as the Tokyo Olympics, that this normalizes seeing women in leadership positions. Um, it also can inspire people in, as they serve as role models. So it's not just the fact that they're filling a position as a woman, there are other added benefits as well. And then I also think that true gender equality won't be really achieved until we have mediocre women <laughs> in positions of power as well. Um, so once we have that, then we'll have the same, same gender equality as mediocre men in positions of power. So I don't think it's a bad thing at all to assign people to um, positions. I totally agree with Christina. Not just because they are women, and we just don't know. There are so many women who are so talented. Why are they not there? Right? That's my question. And I think it's because of the selection process for one, and then they just uh, appoint the uh, people who they know, which is not a transparent uh, process, right? So uh, we need to make the selection process transparent uh, to show and demonstrate why is it that these people are selected? Why is it that they are nominated? That has to be clear to everyone. So that way, those people who have such credibility um, can be well demonstrated through transparency. And that's not just for women, that's also for men, because there are a lot of talented women who are out there who are not nominated to that position, and it's unfortunate. Um, if I can just add, we're talking about making sure that we have women in these positions, and I wholeheartedly agree that we should have women in the positions in all conferences and committees, but we need to take a step back, look from the gender lens and say, what are we doing to enable the women to be in these positions? Are women not in the positions because they can't leave their families behind because this is a male dominant area and the individuals that are fully qualified perhaps also have a young child and they have no childcare. So not only do we have to have the quota and we have to have the positions, but we have to provide the support network to enable those women to take that position and to succeed in what they are doing. We can't just put them in the position and let everything else in their lives fall to bay. Thank you. All right, we have one more question. So when you find gender discrimination in your office or in your work, do you always raise your voice and speak out and how? I sometimes hesitate to raise my voice, concerned that my male colleagues feel bothered and bear negative perception about having a female colleague, which might close the door for my followers. So this person who's asking the question is worried about also negative consequences on them for speaking out. Let's begin. So yes, I have such experience myself, so I totally, understand this and this uh, UN committee for eliminating uh, uh, discrimination against women and uh, this committee has been making recommendation to Japan uh, for many years already which is to create a committee uh, for human rights when there is discrimination against women against LGBT um, such committee that people can turn to to make a claim of being discrimination, such a committee on human rights, that is a, this, this, this is a recommendation of the UN committee, but it's never been established. Unless uh, as there's such a committee, uh, people are told that it's uh, your misunderstanding uh, that you are being discriminated, but actually that's not the case. So something like that. Therefore, we need to have a third party committee on human rights which can lead you to resolution of such discrimination.
So I think in the workplace, there are different types of gender discrimination that I have come across. Um, sometimes it's just basic language. Uh, in the English language, we um, time, sometimes skew with gendered language. So um, I try not to be confrontational and I would just mention it privately to the person. So for example, recently a, a colleague of mine, he used the word uh, manning for um, staffing. And I just mentioned that to him, oh, maybe it's better if you use this word. And he took it very well. Um, there are also ways in which um, there's discrimination that is more difficult to um, engage, uh, such as with people who are your superiors, your bosses. And in those cases, I sometimes just ask them to repeat themselves. This allows them time to think about what they've said. And sometimes it changes what they, their response, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but those, that's a little bit, little bit trickier to approach. And then in terms of how you can raise your voice in terms of gender discrimination in your workplace, I think for women, it's a lot easier to approach um, gender discrimination as not a personal issue, but as an issue representing um, that affects other people. So I think for a lot of women, when we speak up for ourselves, we are viewed negatively. But if we speak up in protection or in advocacy of others, we are viewed positively. And so if it's an issue that other people can benefit from by raising your voice, I think that's a great way to approach it, to find allies and approach it as a group or as a team uh, on a, an issue that might be discriminatory, such as uh, how people are selected for assignments or special projects. Um, so there are different strategies, but it's, it's not very, um, it is not as very clear cut and direct as, I, as we would all like it to be. I always say that um, actions speak louder than words. So typically when I encounter something discriminatory, specifically in some type of uh, a conversation or in a question where it seems that they forget that I am the, the female in the defense sector and that perhaps my husband who is not in the military um, is not the responder. Um, I often correct them in my response. So when someone says, oh, what does your husband do in the military? Why are you at Yokota Air Base? Um, rather than being confrontational, my response would be, well, I serve at USFJ, United States Forces Japan, and I am an Army officer. So I think that correcting um, the response in a mature way without being confrontational is one way um, to direct it. And then also making sure that your actions reflect um, what you would want them to reflect. Understand that sometimes we might have to take just a little bit larger of a step than maybe our male colleagues, but that is keep the door open for the next generation. And as we continue to tear down the, the barriers, um, the next generation will be better. Um, I would like to think that my daughter now at 16 um, definitely has a better opportunity and advantage than I did uh, when I was 16. And I think that the female perspective in these webinars um, is something that also allows for us to address the discrimination um, and to come together and to provide those insightful thoughts. Thank you so much. This concludes our Q&A period. I wanna thank everyone for their thoughtful questions. I apologize that we weren't able to get to all of them, but they're all very thoughtful and really, really well thought out. And I wanna also thank Chris, Aja Wilhite and Dr. Murakami for their presentations today. They're all very inspirational women who are doing really great work. Um, they've shared some really great insights with us. And we hope that this, this session inspires some of the young women listening in here today to consider pursuing careers in peace and security. It inspires everyone, including men, to encourage and support women who decide to enter these fields. After all, the speakers have touched upon Ensuring female participation in all fields, especially in peace and security, leads to better policy and to better results. So thank you all so much for your time. I will now turn it over to Kelsey to close out this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Before we end the program today, we'd like to invite our audience to take our short event survey. So you should see a QR code that will be popping up on your screen soon. Great. And so 
while you take a moment to answer, I would like to also thank our speakers, um, Dr. Murakami, Mitra Wilhite, and Christina uh, for joining us today, for sharing your personal um, and professional experiences and expertise, and kind of delving into some of these complex issues with us. Thank you as well to Jessica for your expert moderating and stewardship of the event. A special thank you to our simultaneous interpreters and technicians at NHK and our captioners at UD Talk. Lastly, I'd like to invite you to visit our website um, or social media for further information on our upcoming events related to Women's History Month. We have one uh, next week on the 31st, we'd like you to join us. As well as new funding opportunities specifically designed to empower women and to advance gender equality. The deadline for these funding opportunities is March 31st, so we hope you apply. Thank you all so much again for joining us today. We hope that you continue to remain safe and healthy during these uncertain times. Thank you so much again and take care. <laughs>